Um, as I say, it's all about student entrepreneurship. When I was at uni myself, I remember sitting there one night and thinking I could really murder a takeaway and uh, no one was delivering. And I thought, hey, somebody should really come up with a service that delivers on behalf of independent takeaways. And since then, I've watched Deliveroo and Just Eat steal all the millions that uh, I should have made myself. So uh, thankfully, we've got some inspiring student entrepreneurs here today who haven't made the same mistakes that I did. And we'll be hearing from them in a little while. Uh, I'm also joined by some great people here at the university who, who are supporting our entrepreneurial ecosystem. We have uh, Kerry Brunn and Bob Lee uh, from the Enterprise Startup Team who support students to start their businesses through a combination of funding, events, workshops, programs, that kind of thing. And the students that uh, you'll hear from today and, and the entrepreneurs have all uh, gone through um, that, that, uh, some of that support. Uh, and we have also got some representatives from the um, Startup Society. Um, this is the University Startup Society whose purpose is to encourage the spirit of entrepreneurship and the creation of startups at the University of Birmingham. Uh, and we have Vice President uh, Kushal, uh, Chief Hello. Technological Officer uh, Andin uh, here as well today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to um, jump over to our student entrepreneurs uh, in a moment. Uh, they are Harriet Noy. Uh, John Sewell and uh, Lao Ludada and Oyen Adebayo. And they're all going to talk about uh, their, their businesses, their journey, uh, the work they did while student entrepreneurs, give some tips, some advice, uh, and just generally uh, give some really inspiring talks about what it means to be a young entrepreneur. Um, just a couple of uh, things to mention. Um, if everyone could keep their mic muted um, throughout, that would be much appreciated. Um, there will be some opportunities for Q&A at the end of each uh, of the presentations. Um, and we will also have a more uh, in-depth Q&A session at the end of uh, today's uh, seminar. Um, you're also welcome to turn your videos on if you want to. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Um, and uh, if you do want to ask a question, um, then you can either pop it in the chat um, throughout uh, or use the raised hand uh, button um, and we'll, we'll jump on that. So um, final thing to say is that the, uh, the session is being recorded and everyone hopefully uh, saw that in the material that came out. But if anyone has any, uh, any questions around that, then let us know. Okay, so without further ado, then I'll uh, hand over to Harriet, first of all, uh, who is going to uh, talk to us about her journey as a, as a young entrepreneur. So Harriet, over to you. Hi there. Um, my name's Harriet. I'm a final year um, economic student at the University of Birmingham. During lockdown, I founded Hazar. Um, so I thought I'd tell you, give you a bit of background to what Hazar is. Um, let me just get rid of this. So Hazar is a zero waste um, marketplace app for students. So students can buy and sell anything from clothing, textbooks, costumes, and household items on our app. Um, the difference with our platform is that you buy it online and then hand over in person. So we have absolutely no postage. So by cutting out postage, we eliminate um, any wasteful packaging and travel miles that's associated with postage. Um, at the moment, we're just set up on Facebook. Um, we've got Facebook marketplaces at different universities across the UK, but the app is in development at the moment is, and is due to launch after Christmas. So why, why did we set up? Um, so last year, I lived in a house of 10 girls. Don't ask, it was pretty manic. Um, and we were all part of different sports teams. And you may or may not know, but um, every Wednesday at the University of Birmingham, it's a sports night and you need a new costume every week. Um, and every Tuesday, my house would be frantically on Amazon Prime, like, oh God, I haven't got a costume. Um, and then that Amazon Prime something, it would come the next day. And you know what Amazon's like, like, you order a pair of pig ears that are this big and they come in a box this big with so much wasteful packaging. And I thought, actually, we don't, we don't need to be doing that because the, the themes rotate around the different sports clubs. So actually someone two doors down the road had that same theme the week before and has that costume lying on their bedroom floor that they're never gonna wear again. Um, so there was clearly a platform missing for students to buy and sell between each other. Um, so that's kind of how the idea came about. Um, and then I'll talk to you a bit more now to you now about my journey from that idea to where I am today. Um, so taking it a bit, taking a bit of a step back, um, at the start of my second year, I set up something called Plastic Free UOB. That was a student-led society working to reduce single-use plastic on campus. My friend and I set that up with the goal of um, bridging kind of the gap between the, the staff at the university and the students. And we all, we, we held lots of events such as 
Littopix, Canal Cleans, we invited speakers in to inspire students on how to reduce and use plastic in their everyday life. Um, and we have 400 members um, and that kind of, I'd say that kind of sparked my interest in sustainability and from the plastic free, it kind of got me thinking a lot more about sustainability, especially around like university. Um, so I suppose without setting up plastic free OB, I probably wouldn't have thought about setting up Hazar. Um, so obviously I've said about how I got the idea of setting up this marketplace for students. Um, so how did I actually kind of go about doing that? Um, so, so I remember the day, the day I thought of the idea, um, I just made a Facebook marketplace and called it, um, we called it like Depop actually at the time, which was obviously, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Depop, but lots of students use that. So the idea was that it's the University of Birmingham's Depop. Obviously it's a bit copyright, so we've had to change the name. Um, so literally all we did was made the Facebook page, um, stuck up 20 posters around, around um, the library with a QR code linked straight to the page. And we did one Facebook post on the big university page with 30,000 members. And literally within two days, we had 4,000 members on this page. It just absolutely blew up. I remember sitting in the library and hearing people like talking about it, like, oh, have you seen that new, have you seen that new thing, Beepop, Beepop? And I was just sat there really smug, like, oh yeah, I actually made that. Um, so literally it just absolutely blew up. And then between, so we set that up in January, between January to when all the students had to go home because of COVID, 14,000 pounds worth of items were sold on the page and it just was growing. Like it's just been growing ever since really. Um, so obviously I, I saw an opportunity there. I luckily with being a student, I asked my friends at other universities, do you have anything similar to this? And they all said no. So I saw a huge opportunity there and I thought, well, why not make an app that gives every university their own um, mi like mini like Beepop. Um, there was quite a lot of problems with the Facebook marketplace as well. Um, so it kind of making a more sophisticated platform just seemed like the obvious kind of way to go. Um, so, so then obviously got this, I had this idea and I was thinking, okay, what do I do? I've got no money, I can't build an app. Um, so I reached out to one of my main mentors uh, um, who's still my main mentor now. I said, what do I do? And he said, well, why don't you try and approach a computer science student and build the app with him? Um, so I did that and I tried working with probably about three different computer science students every time just, just wasn't working. It kind of became, obviously computer science students, they learn how to make an app. In lectures, they don't really like, they, they've not really got that much experience building like a proper app. Um, so I just found that it just wasn't really working and I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the quality of the product that I was after um, by like through this approach. Um, so I started getting quotes and stuff from um, different app development companies and they were all in the region of around like 20,000 pounds. And at the time I remember thinking, how the hell am I gonna get 20,000 pounds? I spoke to my parents and everyone was almost laughing. At how, how am I gonna get 20 grand? And Dan Turner, who's my mentor now, he said, Harry, if you can't raise 20 grand for your idea, it's probably a crap idea, you should probably just give up. And for me, that was my biggest turning point. I thought, all right, whatever, I'm, I, can, I can do this. I'm gonna get that investment. So the following day, I put a pitch deck together, um, worked on it for the next two weeks, perfecting it, making it as good as I could, and then sent it out to as many people as possible in my LinkedIn connections. Um, I've always been quite big on networking, so I had quite a lot of people that I could approach. Um, and I got a lot of no's and then for about a week I was being quite demoralized. Oh no, I was looking into bank loans and I was just thinking, oh, what am I gonna do? I just remember it was peak of COVID and everything. I was thinking, oh no, what am I gonna do? And then it was a Saturday morning and I had a, I got a reply from a guy that I did work experience for um, back when I was 14, who now lived in Dubai. And he said, you know what, Harriet, my wife and I have always believed in you from a young age. So let's give it a go, why not? So I, so I said, I just remember jumping around the kitchen, telling my parents, we were just jumping around. So I pitched it to them the following Tuesday, right, managed to get 20,000 pounds investment off them, um, which was at the time I had an, a quote for an app developer for 10 grand. So that that was on the basis of half, like half my investment going for the app development. So I was buzzing that I'd got that investment. Um, then it fell through that app developer. And that was, that was probably one of my, that was a very low point and a big struggle that I had um, trying to, that was probably, yeah, that was probably the biggest low I had, just didn't really work out and it really knocked me back. But then I just got back up, um, began conversations with other um, app development companies um, and then ended up, now I'm working with a company called Niam uh, Marketing. Um, I met the lady who owns the company on LinkedIn. Just like, she just said that she was like helping out with some things and if I needed any help with anything. 
So I just reached out to her. We got on super well. And she said, actually, I've got an app developer and an app designer that I want that could work with you on this. Like, what do you say? Um, and yeah, so now we, we work together because I couldn't afford, they were quite out of my budget. I couldn't afford um, them. So we've done like a cash equity split. But I'm absolutely, like could not be working with a better team. It's going so well. And we're on schedule to launch the app after Christmas. So that's super exciting. Um, and in the meantime, obviously, we've got that Facebook page set up at the University of Birmingham. I didn't want other universities to miss out and I wanted to start growing the traction for Hazar prior to um, launching the app. So I set up Facebook marketplaces at different universities across the UK. I was initially just going to set up about five, but I put on our social media, like, if you want to set up Hazar at your university, get in touch. And within our first week, we had 35 uh, Facebook marketplaces to set up at 35 different, univers uh, different universities. They were all... And they've all got a head of Hazar at each uni running that page. Um, and the head of Hazars are amazing. So we've now got, we only launched our social media around a month ago. And we've now got over 11,000 students across our platforms. Um, and setting up those fa the Facebook pages have, has been amazing. And we like working with, um, so this, this, is a, this is a photo of, this was after our first week. So we've actually, we're actually at a lot more universities than this now. Um, but this is just a snapshot of some of the universities that we're at now. Um, and something that's quite interesting as well is that I was, people were saying to me that, Harry, you need to launch the app in September. If you don't launch the app in September, you've missed your market, you need to get to market quickly. And that was really stressing me out in terms of finding an app developer and putting like time pressure on. But actually by setting up these Facebook pages first, we've learned a lot, which we can now, which we would have learned, which would have caused problems if we made the app launched in September, for example, we were initially on the Facebook pages, we had University of Leeds and Leeds Beckett as separate marketplaces. But it became apparent that actually these should be joined together. So on the app, Leeds is just going to be one marketplace, same with Manchester and the same with Liverpool. So we've actually learned a lot from these Facebook marketplaces um, that we can carry through to the app. So this is just a photo of some of the head of Hazars. Um, like I said, they're super awesome and they all get involved with loads of different things like I've basically given free reign because every university is different. So I've made a guide for what, like how they can increase the reach at their university, but what works at the University of Birmingham might not work at, um, at Nottingham University. So I've kind of said, although this is the guide, feel free to do as you like. And some of them have been writing blogs for me, doing Instagram content, getting involved with the PR, reaching out to news, like newspapers and trying to get us in the newspapers. Um, so the head of us ours, I've gone above and beyond and uh, incredible. So we have a really great team going on. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of where we're at, at the moment. Um, I'd say in terms of my top tips to other student entrepreneurs or people trying to, with an idea and not quite sure what to do. Um, I'm gonna jump to the, the second one first actually. Um, put a pitch deck together. For a while I was, I would be on calls pretty much every day with people telling, telling them about my idea and they'd go, okay, send me through your pitch deck. And I'd be like, oh, I haven't got a pitch deck. And it just felt like a bundle of kind of confused thoughts when you actually put it into a pitch deck, like, like saying what, what you're doing, what the problem is, what, what solution, what your solution is. And you kind of break it down. You realize, you'll realize gaps in your, in your business and you kind of like things you haven't thought about. It really makes you think about things. So I feel like getting your ideas into a pitch deck is incredible and just helps so much um, with actually realizing if you have a proper business case or not an idea is nothing really at that stage so yeah so put it in a pitch deck network oh my gosh like networking has helped me so much um i've always like i said i've always been quite a keener on linkedin and networked and that has proven invaluable for me now like if i ever have a problem or anything i always have someone i can go to so was it when it was putting together a shareholder agreement obviously when you're a startup you don't have much money so i had people i could kind of draw on in all these areas to help me with shareholder agreements trademarking marketing um my all of my branding was done by someone in my network as a favor um so i just will never be afraid to ask for help people do want to help you is what i found like just literally everything i'm never i just ask so if anyone anyone that knows me will know i just ask so many questions all the time and that's how you're going to learn and that's how i've learned so much um and building getting solid mentors as well just is invaluable um so that's helped me so much um and then obviously like just believe in yourself like you can do it i've had so many setbacks even like when you're tw when you're 21 and you're saying that like, i want to make this app people just think what how are you gonna do that like how are you gonna raise 20 grand 
and I'd just be like, I, I, don't, I just will, like, I know I will. And how are you gonna make this a success? Well, although although I may lack experience in business and everything, like I have that at the energy, the passion and the passion to make and determination to make this succeed. So you just have to believe in yourself and believe in your idea and believe in the vision and mission of your business. Um, and just kind of, yeah, just kind of keep working at it. Um, so yeah, they're my top tips. And if you want to contact me, reach out on LinkedIn, um, email me, follow us on Instagram and Twitter, that'd be amazing. And if you're a student listening and you don't go to the University of Birmingham and you want to set up a Hazara or university, please just get in touch um, and we can make it happen. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, if, if anyone has any questions, drop them in the chat below. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has any questions. Um, Oh, wow. Does anyone have any questions? No, if there's, if there's no more questions, um, then I will pass over um, to John. It looks as if Lloyd was about to ask a question, but Lloyd, perhaps we could uh, hold the questions uh, to the end and we'll, we'll, we'll note that one you just put in. And I'm conscious of the time. I want to give everyone a chance to, to introduce their business. And uh, let's uh, combine that Q&A for the end, I think. But uh, thanks a lot for that. And um, yeah, we'll take note of that and jump back on that later. And perhaps, um, to, you know, see if there's any, any of your other entrepreneurs who can answer that as well. So, um, John, I can see you're setting up. So, yeah, I'll shut up now. And uh, hand back over to you and uh, yeah thanks very much Harriet that was really great yeah so just check everyone can hear me and see everything all good um yeah so so yeah my name is John um I am the founder of Easel um I'm going to tell you a little bit about the business a little bit about myself uh what it was like starting up as a student and where where things are going as well um but I know we're kind of pushed for time so I'll, I'll crack on uh, straight away so what is easel um straight up it's an online art marketplace quite simply um but unlike other uh, marketplaces particularly in the art market we charge zero percent commission fees um instead our artists pay a membership fee and this allows buyers to buy directly from the artists um we essentially want to cut out the middleman and make art more accessible for for everybody um little introduction to myself before I go into a bit more detail about the business. Um, obviously, I went to the University of Birmingham, uh, did my BA and my MA in art history. Um, finished, graduated from my MA last year. Um, and before going to work at the Barber Institute, um, I was, I'd, I'd launched the business already while I was a student, but I was sort of side hustle kind of thing. I was working at the German Christmas markets for a bit. Then I went to the Barber Institute uh, to work with their marketing team. Um, I've also worked with Hive, um, who are a brand advocacy platform, um, who Yanis, who, who founded Tech Week, he was working on that um, as a founder before Tech Week. Um, and I'm currently working uh, at Art Quarter, which is a lifestyle retail and arts complex um, opening. The, well, the barbershop actually is opening on, on Friday. So if you need a haircut, uh, send me a message and we'll, we'll hook you up. Um, but outside of art, um, I'm a massive Liverpool fan. I've lived in Birmingham five years um, and I've never met as many Villa fans as I have in the last couple of weeks since we lost to them. Um, so that's been a tough, tough couple of weeks on that front. But yeah, I love, love sport, love cooking. And I think those kind of uh, my creative outlets um, beyond, beyond Easel. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about me. But where did Easel come from? It's a question you get asked quite a lot. Um, and the main kind of turning point in, in coming to an idea, there were a few main things, but this was the main one. Um, as a student, I was working a summer job in a commercial gallery back home in the Lake District. Um, and this was the kind of conversations I was having with a lot of the, the customers that came in. Um, they'd say they really liked an artwork, but it was just too expensive. And I soon realized that this was because of the commission fee. Um, at the gallery I was working at, uh, the fee was 60%, which is high. It's normally more uh, in physical galleries around 50% and online around 30%. But uh, it gen generally, it, it creates quite a few um, problems. So first of all, um, some galleries and some artists will do it so that they just take the, take the cut out of the, the price of the artwork. So if an artwork's worth £100, they'll take 50 quid. 
Um, and quite a lot of the time, you know, an artist might have put in a hundred pounds worth of hours, let, not kind of withstanding the, the raw materials to make it and ship it and all that kind of stuff. So the artist won't see in the full price of their work if they were selling it um, with the commission fee taken off. If the commission fee is lumped on top, artists will quite often miss out on the sales because like I said, people will say it's too expensive. Um, obviously art's a, a luxury commodity. There's no kind of two ways about that. Um, it's something people might be able to splurge, you know, hundred quid on here and there, but if it ticks over into that 150 mark, things might get a little bit difficult and they might not be able to afford it. And then if people were buying it at 150 quid, um, they're paying over the odds. They're ultimately just paying for the bills of the gallery um, and I, the way I saw it, that there, there could be a different way of doing things. So that's when I realised I had to, to come with come up with a solution. So I thought, well, there's no, there's, there's other out, out, other industries where no commission fees um, is, is taking hold, and the housing market and trading industries are places where I'd, I'd sort of seen it already. Um, and there were a few people doing it in the art world as well, but they were generally taking a flat fee up front to upload an artwork. And I thought it would be better to work on a membership system because that ties in the artists with us. It means that we have a responsibility to sell their work and build relationships um, rather than say, they just put it up there and hope it sells. And there's no real incentive for us to, to help them sell it because we've already made the money. Um, and ultimately I wanted to make a marketplace that took some of the stigma away from art and made it accessible. Um, I had a lot of friends who were telling me these kind of things. I myself as an art history student felt it that you'd go into a gallery or try and buy art online and you just wouldn't know where to start. So that was kind of my main aim. Um, taking the traditional gallery model, shaking it up a little bit, but just in, in the grand scheme of things, it was all about making art fair, transparent, and allowing first time buyers to support early career artists. Um, so obviously I had a solution, but then what was the vision? Um, I want to set, help a thousand artists sell their work. Obviously we're still kind of a way off that. And I don't think that's even the end game necessarily. Hopefully it will get to 10,000 artists and so on, but that's, that's where I want to be um, just on a personal level. And I want to do this by supporting emerging artists, like I said, bringing new audiences into art who are probably going to be the people who can afford the work of early stage artists. And in doing so, bridge that gap um, and help those artists who've just left art school, but who are still building a name for themselves to, to get up that ladder uh, and to continue their practice. Like I say, ideas aren't aren't value aren't valuable at all really unless you actually take action on them i was talking with some entrepreneurs about this the other day um and i actually i sat on sat on the concept for about a year before i took action um eventually i my mates i think ultimately convinced me to to, to pursue it um i came up with a name easel uh, this was the first sort of iteration of the logo um and we uh, I, I just started putting it out there, speaking to artists and building up a, a small base of people that, that would potentially use it. Um, then I came into, you know, so, somewhat fortunately, I suppose I came into a, a small amount of inheritance that meant I was able to, to pay to build the site. Um, so uh, I got the ball rolling on that front. Um, and this was all while I was still um, a student. And there's obviously kind of a few, is it, I think, being a student is, is a difficult thing. Starting up a business is a difficult thing, but I actually think that the timing of starting up while a student is, um, it's, it worked quite it worked well for me, I think. Um, as a humanities student in particular, you don't have a huge amount of contact hours. So you've got a lot of time where you're probably gonna be sat at a desk anyway. So you might as well use that time um, productively and, and try and branch out and do different things. I mean, other people, maybe it's, um, I mean, like how it started off starting a society, those kind of things are, are really great ways of building up that um, experience as well. Um, obviously, there's the academic side of things. I didn't, I didn't want to be one of those people that sort of started up a business and then dropped out of uni. I think that's a kind of strange narrative that we like to press sometimes. 
Um, I wanted to make sure that my university work was as of the highest standard as possible. Um, because I think as well that if you can hold yourself to that standard academically, that will rub off and being in a routine and just doing things correctly rubs off on your business as well. So, so that was kind of my, my aim. Um, and then there's, I think, something that is maybe not mentioned a lot, but we should make sure that we as entrepreneurs, particularly, but students as well, celebrate having fun a lot along the way. Um, being an entrepreneur is quite a long journey. I'm, I'm <laughs> increasingly figuring out. Um, so you need to be aware of that and not try not get too bogged down um, in the day to day and enjoy those moments where you can have fun, um, like graduation and various nights out, like sports night as well, if, if that's your thing. Um, so the journey, um, like I said, we started off with the design uh, and web development at the start. Um, B Enterprising came in to help with legal fees actually um, at that kind of stage in 2018. Uh, I launched the site in August 2018 um, and since then we've kind of been growing our community. We've got uh, 64 artists with work on the site at the moment with about 300 uh, active members, uh, non-artist members. Um, and one thing I think is that I've found is that you when you're building a platform like this, um, you, you might necessarily always be able to provide the primary service. Um, obviously, we're hoping to help artists sell their work, but that's not always possible depending on who they are, what their work is, and, and how we're able to market ourselves. Um, so we've looked to put on exhibitions um, like the picture behind where we got to 200 odd people down to Attic Brew Co. in State actually for an exhibition that was amazing. A lot of the artists sold a lot of work and um, I was hoping obviously to do more of that this year, but uh, <laughs> number five, COVID, uh, everyone I think has been pretty uh, heavily impacted by that. Um, and obviously it restricted some of the stuff we could do, but it also meant that we had time for reflection um, and to think about how to move forward, because I think what COVID has provided a lot of people is it's taken the pressure off their audience and might not necessarily be expecting a huge amount from them. So we've been able to sort of step back and think about how to take easel to the next level. The Birmingham Enterprise community have been a big part of that. Um, I'd be happy to, to talk more about them later on, um, but I'm on their forward accelerator program. Um, so I've got office space in AlphaWorks uh, and a lot of the resources um, in terms of planning for the next stages. Um, and also we've been fortunate to have a couple of interns come on board um, I think Leslie's here in, in watching somewhere. Um, she's been great helping me sort that out. Um, and I'd, I'd recommend anyone, uh, particularly as a startup, in terms of just invaluable, um, and particularly UOB students, as one myself, I'd say they're, they're pretty uh, pretty clued up and, and on it. So uh, so I'd definitely encourage you to, to reach out and get involved with that. But obviously the next step, hopefully the COVID thing, um, still very uncertain obviously but hopefully things can can move forward um we're working on developing the website we've got new partners uh, on board to do that uh, kind of just ui ux sort of stuff um to begin with i also want to explore artist education um through easel obviously we have a big network of artists and the thing i've found with a lot of them is they come out of art school they're really good at making art but they don't get taught how to run a business um so i think there's elements that where we can come in and help them on that sort sort of thing um and then ultimately as well i want to start exploring arts management so this is imogen she's one of our artists um and this was a commission i've helped her to arrange at art quarter and um, the project i'm working on um it was made especially for the space um and i, I want to start using our artists um or helping our artists i suppose um and, and using them to connect with businesses who want art um, and, and marrying those two up. Um, so that's that's the plan on that front. But ultimately this is why it matters. Why buying art from emerging artists is something that we should all be doing if we can afford it. And um, this is this is one of the artists messaged me this earlier, well, over the weekend actually. Um, it's, it just gives a sense of the kind of happiness and excitement that buying an original artwork from a young artist can give 
um, when you're buying work from young artists, you're not just buying something that's going to look nice on your wall. You're obviously you're making someone very happy, but you're also allowing them to continue to make art and progress in their career, which I think is is something we should all really get behind. Um, it's it's much better than, than spending your money um, at IKEA anyway. I think. Um, but yeah, I'm probably pushed for time. Um, so that's my message. Buy art, support artists, don't pay commission. Uh, please check out the website. If you've got your phone, you can quickly scan that QR code. Um, otherwise, follow us on social media or message me on LinkedIn um, and I'll be happy to have a chat. So yeah, if anyone has any questions, pop them in the comments below, I suppose. Awesome. Thank you, John. That was that was really fascinating and, and uh, you know, great message there at the end as well. Um, <clears throat> I can see we've had a question come in from from Mohammed. I think we'll save that one uh, for the end as well and hand over to uh, Oyan and Laulu to uh, talk about their journey, their business. Thanks, John. Hello. Sorry, bear with us whilst we share our screen. Hi, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Good Where afternoon. Watching. My name is Oyin. And I'm Laulu. And, and we, we are Neo <laughs> Enterprise. <laughs> it's really hard to get two people to speak at the same time. Yeah. So what we do is that we use um, innovative tools to economically empower Black women through sustainable enterprises. Um, and we're really excited to kind of give a talk here today about our journey. It's been a messy one, but <laughs> um, it's it's been worthwhile. Yeah. So as Oyan said, our mission is to break this vicious cycle of poverty for black women. Um, we are black women and we believe in brands, not just for us, but have a, a greater social impact altogether. So we're made up of two major brands. So we're made up of Neo Hair and Beauty and Neo Network. So Neo Hair and Beauty is actually using technology to power quality Afro hair and beauty services and products across the Midlands and across the the world. Our scope is not just limited to the Midlands, but um, we want to go across the world. And then we've got Neo Network, which is all about increasing the career and business prospects of Black women um, in the Midlands and, and far and wide. Um, so within Neo Hair and Beauty, we actually offer services. So we service over 350 clients across the Midlands um, where women can get their hair done. And we also sell products as well. We've got a colloquial term that we use called slay play care. Slay meaning get your hair slayed, get your hair done. Play meaning um, learn, learn how to actually do um, Afro hair and beauty styles and care by products and services. Now on the Neo Network, we, we offer product and programs um, that actually increase the career prospects of black women. So for example, um, we've got a program with one of our amazing partner organizations called Coding Black Females called the Black, black Coded Bootcamp. And that's you know, raised a lot of profile of, of our organization. So we've been featured on BBC News, the Metro, um, The Voice, and so on and so forth. And we have 50 amazing black women learning to become software developers. Um, and actually they will be able to get secure jobs in companies like Google, Apple, and so on and so forth. So who am I and how did this start? So <laughs> this all started off with me getting Lowly to come and get her to come and do her hair in my house, in my uni flat back when I was in Nottingham. I'm an, I've, I've just finished my MSc in development economics at UOB. But previous to that, I actually was doing a degree in economics and business management. So it's amazing to see Harriet doing the same thing as well. Yeah. Um, so although we're economic students, we also have an entrepreneurship flair. Um, so as I, I kind of have, past project management experience at Rolls-Royce. Um, I did a lot of work in the, in the um, logistic department. So I did that during my placement year um, and I have about 10 years experience um, doing hair. So it's almost a natural talent of mine that I've grown with. And, and now I wanna be able to empower more women to be able to do that. Now, my entrepreneurship journey started off um, as, a, as little as the age of seven, um, when my dad would get me to write contracts with him um, for massive telecommunication companies. But it began to solidify as I actually took opportunities when, when I actually did sort of stuff I was passionate about. So I was part of a group called Enactus um, back when I was in Nottingham. And I ran a project called Core, which essentially used um, 
recycle coffee grounds to create cosmetics to economically empower sex workers so that they don't have to sex work anymore and they can actually become sustainable entrepreneurs. So I built that and I actually that inspired me to actually now solidify this thing that I did that was here into something and now it's, it's been built into almost like a nation. So like Oyin said, the journey began where she, I found her on campus and I was like, can you do my hair? And everyone knows those hair and um, those hairstylists and customer relationships become very tight. So I think over time we began to discuss about social impact, social in enterprise, and also what that looks like in a sustainable way, because we always saw that um, social impact through business was kind of almost stunted and didn't always have a global impact that we both realized we wanted to achieve. Um, but before I became the chief marketing officer, I had no marketing experience. I was, my plan was to become a social worker. Um, and after that, I, I think I changed my mind and interned for an organization that reaches out to over 3000 students, um, a Christian organization, and they set up um, self-development and spiritual empowerment um, programs for students across 25 universities and then I took time out to actually work at Nottingham City Council and there I got involved with Nottingham City Citizens and also a brand called Ask Lion which worked to improve the digital upskilling of residents within the city um, so I spent a lot of time working in think tanks about um, corporate and strategic change across the city. So where did the journey begin? So as I said earlier on, it started off with me just um, being able to service about, I had about 100 clients on my books. And um, I wasn't really talking about it much. And I remember um, in, our, in our group where we, in our, one of our societies that we were part of and how we met, um, was like, oh yeah, you do hair? Like, why can't you tell me about it? And why don't you shout more about it? Mm. So I decided to actually start posting about it. Then my friend, uh, one, of, one of our friends, um, was like, oh, let's do a photo shoot. So I did, yeah. we did a photo shoot and then we, we actually actually set up something called the ambassador program at the time I didn't know what I was doing I just did it yeah. um, and then it grew and the, the hunger grew then then I um, then I did some photo shoots just for fun just to present my business idea um, in the incubator that I was part of at the time and then we got featured in the biggest black hair and beauty magazine at the time um, then that grew into something called beyond hair which I was um, when I got talking to a lot of my friends who had business ideas and naturally I'll be like oh you should do this with it then we thought let's set up something called beyond hair and that's when actually Laulu came on board properly yeah she was like what do you what help do you need and she started <laughs> to help me and I was like why is she helping me so much um I was going for a lot of imposter syndrome we cancelled the event twice yeah we finally had it in February 20, um, 2018 at the time um in uh, in a place called Antenna in Nottingham and we had an amazing turn I believe there was a hundred people there yeah. um, a lot of brands were um, donating to the um to us giving us free products. And I was like, wow, this is a thing. And till today, a lot of people are impact, were impacted by that one event yeah. because um, we gave them journals at the event where they documented their journey and doing, um, and also they could do something with their ideas. So I was like, this is, we've come onto something here. And so that's kind of how Neo Enterprise as an organization was birthed. Yeah. And the funny thing about the event is that we knew that in the planning of this event, it's going to be fun, but we wanted something tangible. And we're all, we both agreed that you attend way too many um, networking events and there's nothing tangible that happens after it. So we, we thought about the actual things that people need when they're going to ne a networking event or the forms of empowerment that they need. And we realized that there was something with hair creativity and enterprise. We, we, didn't re we couldn't really figure that out yet, but there was just something there. So we decided to do something beyond this Beyond Hair event because um, there was so many feedback. We just we just couldn't know what to do. So we decided to pitch. To, um, it was like a Dragon Den style pitch. Yeah, the Nottingham um, version. Uh, well, Nottingham version. And we were really convinced that it was Dragon Den, but it really wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we decided to pitch um, for, for some funding and it was the most nerve wracking thing ever. Yeah. Um, and at that point we pitched to, to I think it was like 2000 pounds or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're like, actually, you're in the wrong room. So I, we think you should you should go to the Cap Capital FM and pitch to Capital FM and Nottingham Building Society. So we did that. And we actually got a lot more money. And yeah. that way we were able to run workshops for um, refugees, um, um, women who had suffered from domestic violence and, and teaching them how to braid. And actually at the end of it, a lot of these women actually saved a lot of money um, 
you know, in that they don't have to do, they don't have to pay a hairdresser to do their and um, their daughter's hair. And actually, one of them actually started off doing this on the side. And in the meantime, we were discovering that actually, if we can train more women who are underserved or um, are basically living in poverty to learn a skill and be able to use that skill to bring an income in for themselves, then you we achieve both sides of our business that yes. initially were just hair and enterprise. Um, so through these workshops, we're able to really try through trial and error be able to test the idea of bringing in other hairstylists who could help with the workshops and also teaching teaching them to upskill themselves or improve their own skill set and really marrying hair and business so um now obviously i i believe that as entrepreneurs mature their businesses mature as well Definitely. so we this business has actually matured and we we took a, a steep a steep risk and, a, and, and actually that pivots to, to steep growth. So we decided, you know what? We did Beyond Hair 2018, 2019 in a small way. We're going to go bigger. So we did, it's the first one we had about 90 women there. The, the second one we had about 150 women. And now it was time for me to move to Birmingham to start yes. my master's yes. back home. Um, and we we're like, you know what? Let's look at the millennium point. Mm -hmm. We want 350 women in yes. this space. So we decided to actually do a summit at this point. And the summit was about the connectivity of digital technology to creativity, hair and beauty. Mm -hmm. So we had coding workshops and we had several things in there. Yeah. And we had over 350 women present at this workshop. Now it was um, at this summit, it was, a, it was a really amazing summit. We had speakers from across the, um, the country, um, amazing investors from across the country come to this event. But we were in deep, deep crap. <laughs> we were in deep crap. Okay. Um, I don't swear. So, you know, we were, we were in a lot of crap um, financially. And you know what? But, but what I found was that the risk that, risk that we took actually pivoted us to where we are today. So us getting featured on BBC News with a Black Coded Bootcamp, to be able to have to have over a thousand people, a thousand women from across the world wanted to come on our bootcamp mm -hmm. and also um and also 50 women being trained to become software developers and we can we can be proud to say that we have partners like apple google cap gemini actually wanted to employ some of these ladies yeah. um on on um, on the neo network side of things and on this side of things we also discovered that we could utilize tech on both arms of the business not only could we use tech to empower women and also develop um upskilling and digital boot camps just like the coding boot camp we could also develop a crazy immersive technology um, through the through the medium of an app to basically empower women who don't have access to hairdressers or that finding it hard to source products and be able to give them the support and the need that they need through really meeting their pain points. So um, for why are we passionate about this? We hate poverty we absolutely hate it we don't we can't stand it and we especially hate it for black women um, as well so we we're committed to upskilling black women for the future and whether it be in tech um so uh, whether it be in tech whether it be in non-tech tech roles we want to upskill black women because what we found um as an, someone who studied economics in in depth um, i realized that, um due to the economic world economic forum 2030 predictions by 2030 um, a lot of um, um, a lot of jobs will be eradicated by automation, yeah. and actually, a lot of these jobs are occupied by black women. Hospitality jobs occupied by black women. Social care, uh, social care, low school jobs are occupied by black women. So we wanted to do something about it. Yeah. So we're committed to upskilling black women through that. And we also know that there's opportunity beyond the UK to also run and drive this mission because we see that we are Nigerians in diaspora, and we see even back home how if people are equipped with the right sort of skills, they would be better equipped for the future. Um, and you increase diversity in organizations and also in income. So what are outputs? So first of all, we're building tech. Um, so we actually develop an innovative immersive technology solution for black women and by black women. Um, we've got amazing services and products that we are also launching the one-stop shop um, one-stop shop through, um, through our, um, our new hair and beauty platform, which is actually launching the MVP, minimum viable product, first version, is launching at the end of this month. So we're super excited. And um, we've got a CTO um, um, involved who has 35 years of experience working at Sky. So we're really excited. And also 
we want to be able to boost the future prospect of black women. So we're not just restricting ourselves to the, um, the, boot, um, the black coded bootcamp. We're doing accelerator programs that get black women who are non-techies but want to work in technology driven organizations and also black women who have destructive ideas to actually um, empower them to be able to do that efficiently. Oh. <laughs> there we go. So thank you so much for listening. If you would like to find out more about us, here's our socials. Yeah get in contact superb well thank you ever so much guys that was a fascinating melding there of gender race identity tech you know you name it hair uh, really really interesting and, and, and fantastic and uh, we've had a, a couple of uh, questions come in but I'd like to kick off with with a question of, of my own as we invite others to to use the chat or pop their hand up um, which is kind of pitched to to all three of you um, one of the threads I think that sort of um, underpins all of your businesses is something that we're seeing is more and more in, in important and associated with your generation, which is responsible uh, business, a sustainable business. And, you know, I, I'm just really interested to, to hear from you how important you think that is, uh, how important it was to you establishing your business models. And, you know, what do you think the future holds for startups who are looking to, to work along those lines? I think I think in terms of in terms of sustainable enterprises, um, I think it's so important that at the at the bottom line, at the and we need to have blueprints in our organizations of people, purpose, planet, and profit, right? So those those things need to not be neglected. So whenever we're making those decisions, we have to be um we have to be thinking about these things um, make sure that uh, our planet's not being hurt people are not being hurt and also um we're not neglecting our profits as well great yeah, i would agree with that um so with hazar our mission is to make sustainability accessible to students because at the moment like students students all they care about sustainability they want to have a positive impact but often don't don't know how so we're trying to help students do that um and i would say as well like with with a business i suppose you just got to always whenever you make a decision or do anything, like bring, make sure that you're staying true to yourself and, and true to the mission of your business. Um, so like with Hazar, like before we make any decision, it's always just thinking like, is this going to, is this true to kind of who we are? And um, like, is it is it going to benefit the planet basically? Great. Yeah, and I, I think um, from my point of view, it wasn't necessarily that I just wanted to make a socially conscious platform but I think the the nature of the industry at the moment is that people want to buy local and support emerging talent and that kind of thing so it was it was sort of almost inherent to the the the, the industry and the audience that I was trying to tap into that they were that's how they behave so I think like it's like you say there's there is that hunger in the audience it's just about the businesses providing them the, the means to do do what they want to in that regard. Uh, thank you. That's, that's great. Um, one of the, the uh, questions we had from from Lloyd um, Harriet was whether you had a mock up of your app uh, developed prior to launch. Um, no. Yeah, no, we actually didn't. Um, so we, we've got mock ups now, but when we when we launched the Facebook pages, we didn't have any. We we didn't post anything of what the Hazar app was going to look like or anything. It was just there as an app coming after Christmas. Like, stay tuned, basically. <laughs> <laughs> cool. But did you did you see that as a gamble or were you confident in the the, the development of the app um yeah not not a gamble um i didn't expect the facebook pages to take off as they did um as i said my goal was to only have five facebook pages set up and by our first week we had 30 so it was just i was just kind of going off what students wanted if they just approached me and they wanted to bring it to their uni i was just like yeah go on let's do it cool um, thank you. That's awesome. Um, yeah, we had another question. Uh, John, this one was to you from Mohammed, and he, he asked um, what advice you would give to other arts and humanities students who want to set up a business, but it feels like they're, and I'm doing this because this is in the quote, selling out on their creative ambitions. Yeah, it's, it's one of my biggest bugbears, I think, is uh, <laughs> the artists in particular, but I think it does extend. I mean, I, I think I'm guilty of it too, to, to an extent. Um, is you you do um, you do feel like you're you're selling out in some regards if you're making money, um, 
and I think I'm still trying to practice what I preach, but I, I'm always saying to our artists, like, you can't do what you do if you don't make make money. Um, and it, and I think one of the things about the COVID thing that I, I have tried to bring up a few times um, is that it highlighted how reliant the creative industries and arts were on <laughs> public funding and charity and all that kind of stuff and basically I, th I hope that this puts a shift towards people being more proactive in making their businesses in the creative scene more uh, financially viable from a, a business standpoint and not just relying on, on hands out handouts and obviously that's something I'm working on as well but um, but I think it is it's really important for the particularly in a post-covid world I think it's going to be it's going to be huge Thanks, John. Um, are there any more questions from the room? Uh, I've got a few more of my own, if not, but if anyone wants to jump in and uh, steal the mic, as it were. Should I answer okay. Mohammed's question in the chat about... Um, oh yeah, sorry, I missed that one, yeah, good job. Um, I feel like the reason we were able to scale was because the fact that I am a student making a product for students meant that people could easily resonate with us. Um, so when we launched all of our social media, it's very much like, it's very obvious that it's like, we're students, we're like for students, by students. So we were just like kind of going crazy on Instagram. Everyone was sharing it. We did like a big Instagram giveaway of like some quite cool, like vintage clothes that kind of got us a lot of publicity. Um, it was just kind of just targeting, just, just being like, just people being able to relate kind of like resonate with us I think helps a lot and then we just I think as well just me letting people just if people want to to be head of us are and just like yeah just do it and I give them a bit of guidance and like anyone's welcome even if even if the position of head of us are is taken I just say like we, we'd still like you to get involved so what what like what value can you bring and like do it so like we've got a, a whatsapp group with 45 people in of people like when I when I need a task doing that I haven't got time to do because obviously being like a final year student as well there's a lot of like crap that I've got to do um <laughs> so I just like guys can someone do this and then there's always someone that wants to do it and it's great for their LinkedIn as well I'll always say like share it on your LinkedIn what you've done so it helps them and it helps me so I suppose like that way cool that's really great thank you um I, I guess you've touched on something there that I was interested in which is the the vast skill set that you need to be uh, an entrepreneur nowadays um, you know you need on top of the business acumen that you all clearly have social media um, web design budgeting tax returns you know networking recruiting an army of volunteers all of that stuff you know uh, how did you learn that um, and what advice would you give to people who are looking to to, to develop those skills <laughs> I think um, from, from our perspective we because we're two men two women <laughs> two other people <laughs> um it's it's a lot easier but it still doesn't mean that um it doesn't get hard so um for us um i do a lot more of the boring stuff obviously she does the fun stuff um so like i do like all of the tax returns the you know um the ip and everything like that i think first of all there's a lot of resources out there and a lot of support out there to actually teach us how to do there's a lot of programs i know that um and I know that within UOB, there's a lot of support there. And um, speak to Mohammed. He was he was like pointing you in the right direction. Mohammed is the plug. Yeah, he's the plug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so yeah, he, I'm sure he will point you in the right direction. Um, so for um, and also be don't be afraid to um, not know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, when we were setting up our IP, so I've just I've just done all of our IP um, in terms of like our trademarks um, for Neo Enterprise and all of its other entities. Um, I didn't know what I was doing, but I just did it and got help. Um, and you discover that a lot of entrepreneurs don't know what they're doing either. They're just true. figuring no, it out. No, not even just entrepreneurs. No <laughs> one knows what. <laughs> um, we're all learning, yeah. and I think I think what we're getting good at is learning and learning quickly, yeah. and just being able to jump rope and skip each time. So, yeah. Cool. I feel like in a way to be a good entrepreneur, you have to be quite naive because if you knew what you were getting yourself in for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> I had the same with all of like my trademarking, shareholder agreements, contracts. Like the day my, um, my app developer sent me over the contract, I just expected, okay, cool, I'll just sign it and then send it back. And then I sent it over to a, like a family friend and they just went, you can't sign this. And it was about 
a month of like to and fro and I was just like bloody hell I just thought they'd just send it me over and I can just sign it and off we go. Yeah. <laughs> John have you anything to to add before we wrap up? Um, yeah I think it's it, like the guys are saying it's it's a lot of failing and and trying stuff and it, it sounds it almost like it becomes a cliche but it, it's true um and I, it was interesting actually when Harriet was speaking she said her top top tips top tips were ask questions um and network and I've literally got it written right here my top tip is ask questions and network so like <laughs> um so I think the, and the asking questions thing is the big one because you aren't going to know what you're doing a lot of the time. Mm. But a partic- I don't know if I think it is almost particular to Birmingham in some ways, but here in Birmingham, there's a real desire for people to help you out and yeah. make the whole of Birmingham grow together. Mm. Um, so go and ask people, and uh, 99% of the time, they'll they'll at least point you in the direction of someone else who can help you if they can't. So so that's that would be my advice. Thank you, John. Yeah, we're building on the uh, the city of a thousand trades in Birmingham, yeah. which, is, which is great. So, guys, thank you so, so much for all of that insight and uh, for being so open with your questions. Um, we Everybody here, I'm sure, has uh, gained a huge amount and we wish you all the best of luck with your, your businesses as you take those forward. Um, Anyone who's uh, not had a, a good chance um, to, to um, input, to talk, then you can follow up with us afterwards. Any students uh, who are in the room uh, who are interested in, in this further, then you can speak to the Student Startup Society. You can speak to the Be Enterprising team, Mohammed, Bob, Kerry, who are in the room. Um, yeah, and thanks as well to Lauren, who uh, has been behind the scenes today, uh, working everything out for us on the tech side. So thank you, everybody, again. Um, Really great to speak to you all. And uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of Tech Week. Enjoy the rest of your day and see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.